I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them, as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. <clears throat> Let's pray once more. Heavenly Father, we come to you through our great High Priest who so prayed for us. Lord God, it is a marvel to us, even this morning, to consider that when Christ poured out his heart before you in this way, he was bearing us on his heart. He had us in his mind. His eye was fixed upon us in love, that we might be with him, that by his prayers and by his blessings, we might be kept and guided in this world. Grant then, O oh God, that we may discern how we may serve you as Christ served you, that you might be glorified in us as you were in him. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We have unfinished business with Christ's finished work. Matthew Henry, speaking of these words, says that these are recorded, for example, to all, that we may follow his example. We must, each of us, do all we can in the world. Now it's vitally important that we do not confuse or conflate. We don't run together our works and Christ's work. Christ's work is your hope and your happiness. Your relationship with God, your standing with your Father in heaven rests first and foremost upon the finished accomplishments of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are accepted 
It is not because of what you have done, but because of what Christ has done. But resting in the finished work of Christ means also that we rise on account of that finished work. If we have life in Christ, if we have been reconciled to the Father, then we now are to walk as Christ walked. We are to work as Christ worked. Enlivened by our Master, we live like our Master. We have been grafted into His vine. And the life that is in Him now flows through us. And we bear fruit if we abide in Him. It is because Christ has finished his work that we now begin our work. It is not a work that saves us, but it is rather the work that we do because we have been saved. When our Lord said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He was calling us to a Christ-like life of discipleship. Now good examples at least ought to be stirring. I think it's one of the things that we may have lost uh, to some measure in our society. We tend to assume that uh, everybody who we have set before us has feet of clay. Now in a sense everybody other than Christ is a sinner but very rarely now do we have people that we can genuinely esteem in the way that we might wish. What's striking about some of the, uh, the military history, if you're interested in military history, or, or even to some extent social history, is how many stirring defences or great advances, how many wonderful victories have been won in part because of sterling examples from the uh, American Civil War. Uh, there's a, 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 there's a famous battle with a, a man by the name of Thomas Jackson. And Thomas Jackson got the nickname Stonewall. Why? Because in one particular assault, somebody else was able to point to him and to say to the men, now do you see Thomas Jackson standing like a stone wall in the breach? And that kind of example stirred those around him. It happens on a small scale. It can happen on a large scale. And it ought to be true scripturally and spiritually. We see it, for example, in exhortations that we ought to be like David, who served the Lord in his own generation. And there ought to be a sense in which mature Christians can say without pride, without arrogance, like the Apostle Paul, imitate me. Just as I also imitate Christ. And it's lovely to see that kind of gracious trickle down effect in a healthy congregation, in a lively church, where those who are a little bit ahead on the pilgrimage are helping those who are following after. We are enabled as we either look at the living, living, lively examples around us or we read Christian biography and history. There are targets that are established. There are standards that are set of faith, of fortitude and of fruitfulness. And supremely, the example is Christ himself. Notice what the apostle did say. Not just imitate me. But imitate me in so far and just as I imitate Christ. If I go astray from him, don't follow me. If I fall short of him, you go beyond me. But as far as I have followed Christ, learn from me. The most useful of God's servants in every age are marked by this Christ-like spirit. The one that is revealed for us in the words of our Lord. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And we are living in a society where we tend to work at our play. And we play at our work. I, I remember a long time ago talking to a, a friend. Some of the hardest uh, workers I ever laboured with. Uh, a couple of Romanian brothers who, who came over and said, we will help you. I wanted to do something uh, for my wife in the garden. 
and they came over to, to help us. Um, my wife was away. I wanted it to be a treat when she came back. We only had a limited opportunity, and those guys said they'd give me a half day. Twelve hours. What do our half days look like? For them, it was a, it was a proper day's work. They said, we'll, we'll come, and we'll serve, and we'll labor. And it was, frankly, refreshing. But it's not very normal in our society. We, we tend to have an environment where you know, people turn up, they spend half an hour looking at the job, and then decide it's time for a cup of tea because they've exhausted themselves working out what they might eventually get round to doing. Now, how do we attain to something of Christ's testimony? How can we reach the point at which we are able to say with something like the Spirit of our Lord, I have finished the work which you have given me to do? First of all, brothers and sisters, we need to discern our work. We need to figure out what it is that we are supposed to be doing. Now, again, there is a limitation on us in regard to following Christ in these things. It is unlikely that any of us will be able to discern and define our labours the way that Christ could discern and define his. After all, all the scriptures spoke of the Lord Jesus Christ. You marvel, I hope, at some of the insights that he has. We mentioned it yesterday. His consciousness from the Old Testament as a man who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit without measure. Even from his childhood, he begins to see the path that his father has plotted out for him. And he is able to discern it so that at every step of the way, he is fulfilling all righteousness. Now, you and I are not marked out with the same kind of individual definition in the pages of our Bible as our Lord was. And yet still, it is the same method by which your role in life and your goal in life needs to be discerned and defined. Think of it in terms of a sports team. You see sometimes the children, don't you? They're playing football. And there's a little gang of ten outfield players. And they're all moving like this. Uh, I think there was, I can't remember, was it something that, that they put a team, I think, they put five professional players on a pitch against 100 school children. And the professionals took the kids apart. Because there were 100 kids all running to wherever the ball was on the pitch. And the professionals would just wander into a corner, cross the ball, beautiful pass over to the opposite side. And they were wandering back up. Why? Because they knew where they were supposed to be. They knew what their defined position was. Why are military units successful? When do armies function well together? When each part knows the part that it is supposed to play and is able then properly to function and coordinate together. There needs to be a measure of specificity and definition in our understanding of the work. As there was in our Saviour. You have given all authority to your Son that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. You see, our Lord knew what he was about. Now, it's very proper that there should be a general concern that drives us along. Father, I have glorified you on the earth. That's got to be, if you like, the umbrella declaration. That's what I want to do. How do you want to live? I want to glorify God on the earth. But still, there needs to be some particularity. There needs to be some definition. And you find it, for example, in the kind of imagery that is often used of the church of Jesus Christ. So, for example, in 1 Corinthians and chapter 6 and verse 20. You were bought at a price... Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So this is an inward and it is an outward glorification. And then there is the need to work out how this fits together. And you see that then in the body imagery that is used of the church of Jesus Christ. Not everybody is an eye. Otherwise, where would be the hearing? 
Not everybody is the ear. Otherwise, where would be the seeing? What part of the body are you? How do you fit together with others around you in order that you may serve the God of your salvation? You have that beautiful passage at uh, the beginning of Romans chapter 12. I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Now notice, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but do think soberly. Brothers and sisters, it is not humility to say, well, don't expect anything of me, I'm no use. That's a denial of the grace of God in the church of Jesus Christ. You need to make this careful, thoughtful, humble, assessment of how God has gifted you to serve him as we have many members in one body but all the members do not have the same function writes the apostle so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another notice verse 6 having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us let us use them If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. I tell you, your church would be a dreadful place if everybody were just like you. And the worst person... Or the worst sufferer in such an environment would be you yourself. An accurate self-assessment of how God has equipped you to serve in the place where God has put you. And it's the language of stewardship. God in his grace has not only given you life. But he is strengthening you in that life that you may serve him as you have opportunity. If you're a Christian, you have been given gifts by your heavenly father by means of which you may honour him on the earth. There are no outliers. There are no bits of the, of the body that are just thrown off into a corner to rot by themselves. The life of Christ is at work in the whole body of Jesus Christ. And there needs then to be that faithful discharge of our God-given privilege and duty. What was the, the first or second question that Saul of Tarsus asked the risen Lord when he saw him on the road to Damascus? First was, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. The second question is the the model disciple question. Lord, what do you want me to do? Once you have seen Christ in his glory, once you have understood with whom you are dealing, the proper question that follows with eyes opened by the Spirit of God is this, Lord, what do you want me to do? What is the, and there's no qualification there. There's no, you tell me what you want and I'll let you know if I'll do it. It's Lord, you speak and I follow. You are the master. I am the servant. And my friends, on our knees with open Bibles, you and I need to sort through the spheres in which we live. Section by section. Moment even by moment and ask the question, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do while I'm at this conference? How would you have me speak to the men and women who are around me? How would you have me serve? How can I bring a blessing to the people who are here? Lord, what do you want me to do in my family? What do you want me to do as a husband? And as a wife, or as a father, as a mother, as a parent with a child. What do you want me to do as a brother or a sister, as a son or a daughter? What do you want me to do in the church? How may I serve you there? Do you know what the 90-10 rule is? The 
10% of the people do 90% of the work. You know what it's like in, in so many of our congregations. Well, you, you, you couldn't expect me to turn up early. Or, well, there's obviously no way that I could stay late. Brothers and sisters, if you can spare half an hour on any given Sunday, once, stand in a corner for 30 minutes after everything else looks like it's finished and see who's still there to the end making sure everything gets done. If you do it twice, I can guarantee you'll probably see exactly the same people. Why is that? Now, not everybody can do everything. We'll, we'll talk about that. But what is it that you can do in the congregation? There was an old RAF excuse. I don't know if they still use it. It became a bit of a joke. If you ask somebody... In the, uh, in, the, in the Air Force, if they, uh, if they would do something for you, not me, mate, I'm air frames. Shoulder sloping, they sometimes call it. No, no this, this is my defined little job. Please don't expect me to do anything else. Now, you might say, well, he knows, he knows his job. You said define your task, discern your work. Yeah, the problem was that he just w it was an excuse. It wasn't, this is my role. It's like, don't expect me to help. And my friends, if we're living like that in the church, then there's a problem with us. What if the elbow says, don't expect me to do anything? Okay, I can't do anything with my knees now either. Okay, you might say they're not particularly... Impressive body parts, they're usually hidden in my, in my sleeves and in my trousers. But if my knees won't bend and my elbows won't bend, then my hands and my feet aren't going to function the way they should. There's not a part of the body of Jesus Christ that doesn't have some value, some purpose, some work to carry out. And in society, the church is the church. But Christians... Individually, as well as corporately, we're to be salt and light. How do you serve in your generation? What work has the Lord given you to do? How can you minister lovingly, tenderly, compassionately to your friends, to your neighbours, to your colleagues? Our Lord went about doing good. That was his reputation. We shouldn't be known as the sour and the angry and the hard. Spurgeon used to say he'd rather be known effectively as a soft touch than as a man who never gave anything away. He said there were gypsy signs on the, uh, the road and the walls outside his home. Always knock at this door. You'll invariably get something. Is that your reputation? You can always go to that man. Always go to that woman. It doesn't have to be spectacular. And in almost all of our cases, it won't be. But if we know what God has called us to do, at home, at work, in society, in the church of Jesus Christ, what role and what goal has my heavenly Father bestowed upon me? You'll never be able to say, I have finished the work, if you don't know what it was. So discern your work and embrace your work. Now, the answer to the question, Lord, what do you want me, do, me to do, may seem underwhelming. You may be surprised by the answer. You may be uncomfortable with the answer. You may be resentful of the answer. Sometimes it is hard for us to hear what God wants us to do. What happened when Moses was told to go back to Egypt and speak to the people? Not me, Lord, I'm not quick for that. I can't speak that way. Or Jonah. I'm not going to preach grace to those stinking Ninevites. I knew this is what you were going to do. I knew you were going to have mercy on this godless world. How dare you, oh God, be so kind to these people who deserve hell. Is that how we think? Peter. John. Lord, what about this man? What about that man? No, Peter, you follow me. 
We need to embrace God's schemes, God's ideas, God's priorities for my life, for my relationships, for my home, for my career and my friends. There will be many times when God's word and God's call cuts across your comforts, your joys, your plans, your schemes, your expectations. There is a price to pay for following the Lord Jesus Christ. Take up your cross and follow me. You will sacrifice much of worldly pleasure and praise if you follow after your Lord and Saviour. There are so many things that we do as Christians that the world never sees and in truth the church never sees. Have you applauded the person who cleaned the toilets so that you could use them in comfort this morning? I'd imagine that, I'd guess, that no one here knows who that is, apart from possibly the person who did it. And if they weren't particularly fortunate, the person who asked them if they wouldn't mind doing it. (laughs) What about motherhood? Motherhood is often overlooked even in the church of Jesus Christ. I remember my mother being told, I don't remember it because I was too young, but I remember my mother telling me about an older woman who said to her when she had, you know, all four of us clustered around, my dear, these are the hidden years. No one's going to notice, no one's going to applaud, but the service that you render now is pleasing to God. What is our response? Are we going to embrace any discernible and definable duty wholeheartedly? Brothers and sisters, we need to be cheerful rather than grudging. And sometimes God is going to have to humble us before we are ready to carry out the work that he has given us to do. There are some of us who do, and and if anybody feels easy for you to say, you'd get to stand up in front and tell people what to do. Do you have any idea what a responsibility it is to preach the word of Jesus Christ? Again, I was reading Spurgeon recently, and he said, I would rather be anything but a preacher. Now, he's preaching to thousands. Imagine the pressure upon him. As because of his words, under God, Lord's Day by Lord's Day, life and death are held before men and women. Do you remember the, the boy in the parable who said to his father, I will go, and didn't? He had the appearance of zeal, the appearance of eagerness. He loved to be seen to be an obedient lad, but when it came to the crunch, he never bothered. And my friend's resentful submission will rob us of joy. Perhaps you've learned this from experience. If you go dragging your feet, It will go hard with you. But if you run in the way of God's commandments, it is because God is enlarging your heart. And there's a joy in doing God's will, even when the doing of that will is in itself painful. There's an enduring dignity about being on the king's business. I'm sure most of you have heard the illustration that if the Lord sent one angel down to earth to sweep a street and another down to earth to guard an empire, that both of them would carry out their work with equal zeal and joy. Now, if you're called to sweep a street for Christ, or to clean a toilet for Christ, or to paint a wall, or to serve a cup of tea, are you going to do that because the Master has called you to do it? With joy, with expectation, with a desire to glorify him. If we serve him, then we are bringing glory to the best of masters. Christ has the glory of his father and the good of his people in view when he sends us running. And it was Christ's unashamed and eager and deliberate testimony. I must be about my father's business. My friends, when that comes... Let us go about our work. This is what God has given me to do. I will take this to heart. And then let's pursue our work. 
Once the work has been discerned and defined, once the spirit is determined, let us pursue it with diligence. And here there must be a proper zeal. Now, zeal can be a fearful thing. When Christ set his face to go up to Jerusalem, the people around him fell back because there was a set to his jaw and there was a look in his eye as he strode up on that road to go and die. And there are times and there are tasks when we need to have that kind of single-minded vigour. But brothers and sisters, never forget that the Jesus who strode up to Jerusalem with that look in his eye to die was the man who wept over the city when he got there. That the righteous man of Psalm 1 has those leaves under which many come to shelter and that fruit, fruit which many delight in. That the same Jesus who could stand in God's temple and throw over the tables. And once he'd cleared the place, he could stand there with a whip of cords. And the local thugs were looking their way around the door to see if he was still there. Because they're not going back in while Jesus of Nazareth is there. Is the same Christ who could go down on one knee. And a little child would come to him in the midst of all those big, hairy, ugly fishermen. And he could lift up the child in his arms and use the baby as an illustration. Zeal does not give any of us the excuse to be a human steamroller. Our zeal must be tempered by love, by tenderness, by kindness, by compassion. And yet not diluted by those things. To pursue the course. And there's that beauty then in Christ. What if he'd ever turned aside? What if when he came to Jerusalem, he'd succumbed to the cheers of the crowds to be an earthly king? When they wanted to take him and make him king, when he was handing out the food, where did he go? He went up onto a mountain to pray. And I suspect, I cannot state, but I suspect that one of the things that our Lord was doing on that occasion was asking that his father would fit him again for the work and not allow him to be distracted. In the same way as when Satan had come and said to him, I will give you all the nations of the world if you bow down and worship me. He turned his back upon the devil with scripture in his lips. When he was at the very beginning of his ministry and the disciples went out early to find the Lord Jesus, everybody's looking for you. They all know what you ought to be doing, Lord. I know what I have come to do. My Father has given me a work and I have come to preach and to teach concerning the kingdom. My friends, once you know what to do, either generally or particularly, pursue it. Pursue your primary goals and pursue your subordinate goals and do it like you mean it. Not this faffing about and fudging. There are beautiful illustrations, aren't there, in the scriptures. We would say today that God rolled up his sleeves and got on with the job. He stretches out his arm. He goes about the work. There's a sense in which we can speak of God as if he were a man, saying, I'm going to get to grips with this. There are those moments in the life of our Saviour where you see him and he will not be swayed, even when he's on the cross Come down now, save yourself. What do you see holding Christ to the cross? It is love for his God and it is love for his people. There is zeal. There is commitment. There is determination. You roll up your sleeves. You spit on your hands. You raise a sweat. The language of striving that the apostles use when they talk about serving Jesus Christ. My friends, now is not the hour for the spineless and lily-livered. We need men and women of God who've got some grit and some gumption. And I do mean men and women. One of the Marian martyrs being led to the stake. His wife with a newborn infant in her arms and her children clustered around her, pushed her way to the front of the crowd. Husband, father, carer, protector, 
What will she say to him as he goes to die for Christ? Do not recant. Do not recant. The days when men were men, and so were the women. In the best sense, lest anybody should think otherwise. <laughs> Do you work like a hireling? Hirelings have an eye to the boss, they have an eye to the clock, and they have an eye to their trouble. The boss goes into the, the box on the, the workplace. Oh, he's coming back. Oh, oh. Hi, young here, fellas. Some of us only work while other people are looking. God is always looking. That's the fear of the Lord. It's not, oh, God's about to judge me again. I live before his eye. I want to glorify his name. And whether men see me or not makes no difference. I'm serving him. And therefore I serve him well. It is a joy to be about your master's business, is it not? You're a faithful steward. Smoke to the eyes and vinegar to the teeth is a lazy man sent about a particular task. Are you smoke in Christ's eyes, brother, sister? Are you vinegar to your saviour's teeth? I gave him a job to do. I gave us some work to do. For the glory of my father and theirs. And they've gone about it like a sluggard. Work undone threatens and disturbs our peace. It hinders our communion with God. If you've been a child, I think that covers everybody here, and dad or mum said to you, I'd like you to do this, please. I'd like you to go up to your room. I'd like you to clear your room. I'm giving you 15 minutes. It's incredible how distracted you can get in 15 seconds. And then you hear the tread on the steps coming up. <gasps> Oh, what was it I was supposed to do again? And the door opens. Where's the communion? Where's the joy? If you're at work and you're constantly trying to avoid the job you've been given to do, do you enjoy that work? Are you having a good relationship with the boss? How can you enjoy communion with Christ when you're avoiding the work he's given you to do? Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Andrew Fuller, one of the great uh, Baptist theologians of the 18th century, that was one of his motto texts. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. No excuses, no evasions, no half measures, no distractions, no diversions. Brothers and sisters, once we know what God in heaven has put in our hands, let us do it with our might. Discern your work. Embrace your work. Pursue your work and finish your work. This is Christ-likeness. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Now you know that there will be many temptations and there will be much opposition. And it may be that we're looking long term, or it may be that we're looking moment by moment. But we press on until each appointed task is done, and until the lifetime of labour is over. And you can look at it as a whole, or you can break it down into its constituent parts. Now you can't always do that. Do you know what a Gantt chart is? I used to hate them at work. It's a way of managing a project. You put out this big old scheme and you get these big blocks and you work out how they all overlap. I used to hate them because no one was ever honest about them. Everything could always be finished five years before you thought it could be and for half the price it would eventually be. But there is a sense in which we need to actually work out, how do I get from A to B? 
How do I finish the work that God has given me to do? I do need to count the cost. If I'm going to build that tower, I need to know how much I'm going to have to pay. If I'm going to fight that battle, I need to work out whether or not I can actually do these things in dependence upon God. Our Lord did not sit down until the work was finished. Now again, brothers and sisters, we need to burn on and not just burn out. But are we even burning? Are we serving God with a determination to accomplish what we have been given to do? And it's hard, isn't it? Isn't the last 5% of any job sometimes the really difficult one? There's always that, oh, now I've got to do this. It's sometimes it's the detail work. Now if you, writing a book... Okay, there's a horrible bit in the beginning, there's a lovely bit in the middle, and there's a wretched bit right at the end, where the editor comes back and says, have you thought about this full stop? Okay, I'm going to think about the full stop. Here are the seven sentences I want you to review again. Okay, I've reviewed those. Now what am I going to do? I'm going to read the whole thing over again. I'm going to leave it for two months. And I'm going to come back to it fresh. And I'm going to read it all through again. And I've found another 17 mistakes. And there's bits that I still... Why? Because the job needs to be finished. The same is true if you're working in a garden. Yeah, you see the people that I finished. So I'm going to say to the boys, the boys are, I finished. My daughter comes in, it's all done. I said, no, it's not. All your tools are still lying out there. It's not finished until everything's put away. Now, doesn't it change? Some of you have been a long time on this pilgrimage. Are you able to do all the same work in the same way now as you did when perhaps you were in your teens or 20s or 30s? Wouldn't it be unreasonable if I were to say everybody needs to do the same work in the same way, to the same degree, at the same time? What shifts? Grace. You grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. You become better equipped to serve God. There are areas of your life that you begin to, to develop in. Gift. Gifts are given. Sometimes they grow. Sometimes they're uncovered after a while. You may be able to do something later in life that you never could do earlier. Sometimes you learn to think ahead. Again, there are, there are footballers. There was one footballer. He was never a particularly fast man. But even in his, in, in his 40s, still playing, or like late 30s, I think, in the Premier League, he was almost always first to the ball. You know why? Because he was thinking three yards further than anybody else on the pitch. And there are some older saints, they're just thinking three yards ahead. Sometimes say, if our younger people had the wisdom of some of our older people, or our older people had some of the energy of our younger people, we'd be doing a better job. But brothers and sisters, if you're wiser, you've figured out how to do some of those things. If you've been in the way a long time, there may be a measure of discernment, energy. You grow strong, and then you grow weak. Daniel, I think, was saying yesterday, you know, not an old man, but still you start to feel the aches and pains. There will come a time, you teenagers... When you can't do whatever you like today and not, not even feel it tomorrow. There will come that morning when you wake up and open your eyes. And you realise that your eyelids are the only part of your body that does not hurt. <laughs> and you used to be able to do it without even thinking. And now you have to think about everything that you do because there's a price to pay. Your capacity is going to change. You have children. You get given new responsibilities. There are demands that come upon you at home or at work. And you can't do everything that you used to do. Or you can do things that you used not to be able to do. Opportunities come. The church grows. Or the church shrinks. Somebody comes along. Somebody moves away. There's a constant shifting. And you will have new doors open up that you can go through. You'll be able to go on asking, Lord, what do you want me to do now? How can I serve you today? There's development during the pilgrimage. I would urge you in this regard. 
What time am I supposed to finish? Because I need to keep my eye on the clock. <laughs> Is it half past? Three minutes. Right. Okay, let's crack on. Um, <laughs> finish your work. I think that's the bit this heading. So, <laughs> second part of Pilgrim's Progress. Um, Beautiful imagery there. The first part is individual Christian life. The second part is church and family life. And you see the kids growing up. And you see different people developing and advancing. We have sinful imperfections. We'll never be able to say what Christ said in the way that Christ said it. I have completed everything perfectly. But let us seek then to avoid the that'll do mentality. I'm not talking about crippling perfectionism, but not walking away before the work's been completed and done. Don't take one hour to scope, 30 minutes to work, and another rest of the day to have a break. Rest comes when the work is done, and not until. A holy urgency and a proper stewardship. Why? Because if the lazy man is like smoke to the eyes and vinegar to the soul, then the diligent worker is like cold water on a hot day. And then, in the last two minutes, offer your work. Discern what God has given you to do. Embrace what God has given you to do. Pursue what God has given you to do. Finish what God has given you to do. And offer what God has given you to do to God. You are a servant. You are for him. Not for yourself. I had a friend called Richard. His motto was, God first, others second, Richard the third. (laughs) Better than Shakespeare, I think. (laughs) But it sweetens every duty. What did the apostle say before he got to that list of responsibilities and opportunities there in Romans chapter 12. My friends, do you feel the force of this sweet language? I beseech you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. There's your motive. By the mercies of God that you offer yourselves to him. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What will sweeten every duty? I am doing this for my God. What will put a spring in your step, at least spiritually, if not physically? I am serving my master who has loved me and given himself for me. Can I not now give myself for him? If you have no defined role and no discerned goal, then you will drift and you will meander and you will slide. My friends, we are going to be carried on the currents of this world unless we know the mark toward which we are swimming. Even when you're in the the beach, boys and girls, what what happens to them? They go in here and they end up down there. The current, the tide is carrying them along. What do you need? You need a mark on the shore. That's what I'm swimming towards. If you're going to cross the river, you need to swim upstream in order that you may get out at the same place on the other side. Some of you know the name C.T. Studd. In his poem, Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. We sang. Did we mean it? Thee will I set at my right hand, whose eyes my inmost substance see, and labour on at thy command, and offer all my works to thee. Christ can speak with a finality and a certainty that will be beyond any of us because he is Christ and we are not, and that's fine. But if he has said, it is finished, we at least should be able to say, O Lord, by your grace, I am following. Give me work to do. Let me do it well. Let me do it with all my heart. Let me do it to the end. And let me do it 
with a desire to glorify you. Conscious of the price paid that I might be a Christ's freed man and Christ's slave. Conscious of the privilege extended that in this world I am entitled to call God my Father, Christ my friend, and to serve him in my generation. Living in the light of my Saviour's life and death and working like the Master until my work also is done. Amen. Let's close it. Father, help us to fix our eye upon the Lord. Help us to keep our gaze upon Him. Help us to take up our cross and to follow Him. To serve at every point as we can. Forgive us, Heavenly Father, for our lazinesses, for our sinfulnesses, our selfishnesses, our failings. Glorify Your name in us. Give grace that we may finish the work you give us to do for the praise of the glory of your name. Amen.